And hi, it's Friday, so it's time for another edition of Story Time with Jocelyn. And today we're going to do a story. Since this past Tuesday we uh, posted a NASA space story that we did from NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, we decided this Friday we're going to read a story by Neil Armstrong, the astronaut that first landed and walked on the moon. And his story is called Box Giant Leap. One Moon's Rock's Journey Through Time and Space. And it was illustrated by Graham Baker Smith. So let us begin with the only children's book by Neil Armstrong, the astronaut who first walked on the moon. Box Giant Leap. One Moon's Rock Journey Through Time and Space, written by Neil Armstrong and illustrated, like I said, by Graham Baker Smith. You ready, Jocelyn? Here we go. When I was a boy, I dreamed I was high above the earth with only cows for company. For as long as I could hold my breath, I floated. Beautiful pictures. but I could not hold my breath forever. I'd wake and watch the moon drifting by my window, wondering at all it must have seen and imagining how it was made. I learned that when the earth was very young, 4.5 billion years ago, it was involved in a great celestial fender bender. A smaller planet smashed into earth. The collision sent billions of tons of molten rock into orbit, Jocelyn. Over hundreds of years, this rock merged and stuck together to form a sphere. The Romans called it Luna. The Greeks, Selena. We call it Moon. It was a turbulent and terrifying time for the moon. Lava flooded up from below its surface, filling giant craters like hot soup in a bowl. Geysers of erupting gas shot globulins of melted rock into the sky. Half a billion years of chaos passed before the moon began to quiet down. As soon as the crust cooled, it cracked. A piece of fresh young basalt broke off from a larger rock and rolled away. I call him Bach. Genealogists, people who study rocks, have a saying. Rocks remember. History was recorded in the minerals and marks of each boulder and pebble. During the next four billion years, Bach would see and remember many things. Jocelyn, he saw the sun rise in the east and parade majestically across the sky to set in the west. Occasionally, new stars would burn with a firing brilliance against the velvet blackness of space. Constellations changed their shape as stars were born. Burned for millions of years and disappeared. Back then the earth also rose and set. Hundred million years went by 
and then an asteroid struck Bach. It catapulted him into the sky toward a crater at a terrific height and speed. Bach held his breath for as long as he could, but eventually he fell. Skipping a time or two, he came to rest on the rim of a small crater. Part of his right side broke off when he landed, Jocelyn. All his basalt neighbors were left far behind. He didn't know if they had been vaporized, melted, or blasted far away. Bach, Jocelyn, was alone. It took him about a half a billion years to get over the experience and settle down before once more turning his gaze to the sky. The earth was still there. It was in a state of terrible upheaval. Volcanoes turned its atmosphere to smoke. But when this cleared, Bach could see the blue of nearly formed oceans. Continents would creep out of the sea, linger a while, and then slip once more below the waves. And swimming deep beneath those waves was teeming earliest complex life on Earth. Another millennium went by. The moon was quiet now. Nothing ever happened. But on Earth, plants appeared on land. Amphibians developed ventured out of the sea, and in time, learned to live above water. <clears throat> Dinosaurs roamed the earth, Jocelyn, but they disappeared almost before Buck noticed them. An entire chapter of Earth's history, there and gone in the blink of 170 million years. Bach was then a little over 3.5 billion years old and starting to feel sleepy. Through tired eyes, he glimpsed the rise of the mammals. He saw the earth turn into a giant snowball beneath the grip of the ice ages. Just before sleep enveloped him, he saw a new creature standing on two legs, folding a flint-tipped spear, staring in wonder at the moon. He slept deeply as the moon continued to accompany the earth on its endless journey around the sun. And so he missed the unfolding story of humankind. He missed Plato and Hippasia, Charles Darwin, Maria Mitchell, Konstantin Trofosakovsky, and Betsy Coleman. He missed the birth of the boy who grew up to climb aboard a rocket destined for the moon. Bach couldn't have guessed that his nap would end with a rude awakening early one lunar morning. A particular creature was lifting him with an unusual metal device. He was roughly thrown into a box with some acquaintances he knew only slightly. 
Then the lid was closed and it was dark. Bach felt a brief force. Then a sense of weightlessness for a time. Flames outside the window blotted out of the blue of the earth as the space capsule streaked through the atmosphere, blazing like a comet. The heat stirred a deep and ancient memory in Bach. A memory from so long ago, it seemed like a dream. He remembered the early days of the moon, the chaos and the fire of its birth. He remembered he had been a part of the earth. Millions of people all around the world were watching, holding their breath until they saw the space capsule floating beneath three bright parachutes, splashing into the arms of the ocean. returning all on board safely to the place from which their journey began. And now you know some of Bach's history. You can go and see him at the museum in the United States, or at least part of him. A chip off the old Bach, you could say. Perhaps you might try and imagine what he is thinking as he looks out at us looking at him. Does he see us as something new and different on this earth that he's watched for so long? Or like the dinosaurs, just another species that exists for a brief moment of geological time. After all he's seen, Bach must be very wise. But if you ask him about the Egyptian pharaohs, don't hold your breath waiting for an answer. He missed them. And that is the end of the story. And there is a brief history of the story of Neil Armstrong that he put at the end of this book. And I think I'm gonna go ahead and read it. It talks about the moon. The moon has fascinated us for as long as we've been in existence. It is Earth's only natural satellite, the only object that orbits our planet that isn't man-made. Although it is spins around just like the earth does, we always see the same face of the moon because it rotates in exactly the same time as it takes to orbit the earth. Many scientists believe that the moon was created around 4.5 billion years ago when a planet roughly the size of Mars collided with earth. The impact sprayed rocky debris into space, which eventually gathered together to form our moon. At first, it was a very volcanic, there with lava erupting all the time. But over millions of years, things settled down and became quiet. The only disturbance was whenever an asteroid or a comet struck the moon, creating impact craters that we can still see on its surface. The Earth Our planet is about 100 million years older than the moon and formed when smaller rocks collided and clumped together. The impacts created a lot of heat, and for a while, Earth was boiling ocean of lava. But eventually, things started to cool off, and a crust formed on the Earth's surface. Water vapor escaped, and soon clouds gathered, Jocelyn, as rain started to fall, and meteorites containing water impacted Earth. The crust was flooded, creating oceans. The first life on Earth was very simple organisms that developed about 4 billion years ago. They evolved into much more complex life forms in our oceans and eventually on land. Dinosaurs appeared about 247 million years ago and dominated the planet until some kind of catastrophic thing happened. 
Most scientists think a massive asteroid crashed into what is now Mexico. Mammals started to evolve in new ways when the dinosaurs died out. Homo sapiens or modern humans first walked the savannas of Africa around 300,000 years ago. Since then, we have spread across the world and learned a great deal thanks to ingenious minds like philosopher Plato, mathematician Hapsia, nationalist Charles Darwin, astronomer Maria Mitchell, pilot Bessie Coleman, rocket scientist Konstantin Tordervatsky, and even the first man to walk on the moon, Neil Armstrong. One small step. Neil Armstrong's journey to the moon started long before he climbed aboard his spacecraft. Born in Ohio in 1930, he first fell in love with flying when his dad took him to see an air show. And by the time he was 16, he'd gotten his pilot's license. After attending university and flying in the Korean War, Neil became a test pilot flying all sorts of cutting edge planes as they were being developed. But Neil wanted an even more exciting challenge than that. And in 1962, he applied to NASA to become an ast astronaut in the space program. In 1966, he piloted the Gemini 8 spacecraft achieving the first ever successful docking of two vehicles in space. But minutes later, the two spacecraft began to spin widely and Neil saved the lives of himself and his crew when while under enormous G-forces, he wrestled back control. Safely back on Earth, Neil was put in charge of the Apollo 11 mission, joined by two other astronauts, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins. The United States and the Soviet Union were in a race to try to land on the moon first. On July 16th, 1969, Apollo 11 launched from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Four days later, Having orbited the moon 13 times, Apollo 11's lunar module sat down on the Sea of Tranquility, which is actually an impact crater filled with basalt rock, not an ocean. On July 20th, Neil became the first person to walk on the moon. With 600 million people watching on TVs around the world, his first words were, that's one small step for man. One giant leaf for mankind. Together, he and Buzz spent 21 hours on the moon collecting rocks to take back to Earth for study, including Bach. On July 24, 1969, the crew returned as heroes, splashing down in the Pacific Ocean in Apollo 11's command module. In 2006, NASA announced Neil as an ambassador of exploration and presented him with a small fragment of a rock he had brought back from the moon. During Neil's acceptance speech, he gave the rock a name, Bach. And imagine all the amazing things it must have seen throughout the solar system's history. Neil's wife, Carol Armstrong, had the idea of turning it into a book. And this book is the result. Bach is now on display at the Cincinnati Museum Center Museum of Natural History and Science. And that concludes the story of Bach, the moon rock, and Neil Armstrong's journey in the space program. I hope y'all enjoyed that, and I hope you bared with me on the history of Neil Armstrong. He's actually an inspiration and one of my favorite astronauts to read about. Him and also Jen Lovell, who you would know as a commander of Apollo 13. So I hope you enjoyed that, and I will see y'all next week for another edition of Storytime with Jocelyn.
where we begin the month of July. Bye-bye!